You're very welcome to another episode of the Scaling Your Business podcast. For this episode, we're going to the west of Ireland to be joined by Kenny Derry, the CEO of Galway Chamber. Kenny, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you, Rain, and welcome to the West. Thank you for having me. Beautiful part of the world. Beautiful part of the world. Last time I actually got outside of, I'm on the border of Meath and Dublin. I'm in a place called Ortoat. So by my accent, you might think I'm in Dublin, but I'm actually in Meath. But last time I got out of the kind of GDA, I went over to Keene Beach, actually. So it was my last point uh, yeah. in about the two years. I was actually happily in there swimming with a group up from Galway last Saturday with the Baskin Sharks. Well, uh, I'm very beautiful. jealous. It's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful island as well. I think when I did some research, there was it has five beaches that have that like blue flag status, which is incredible. Uh, absolutely, we had one. So Ackle is is home to me, and that's where I I grew up. And uh, we had the the only place in Europe with five blue flag beaches, and we lost one. There was a wobble for about two years, but thankfully we've got it back this year. So happy out. Phenomenal. You've mentioned you grew up in Ackle. Uh, talk to me. I know you went to a secondary school. I might pronounce this wrong. Mikhail College. What were your early influences? No, what were your early days like? And then we'll get on to influences. What, childhood memories. Oh, in, in Ackle, I think the, the childhood memories, be a beautiful location. Um, my grandmother lived down the road. And I think in, in many of the early days, my family were, were kind of all business people. So you grew up as a child in either the shop or there was a traveling shop or there was a fruit and veg run or there was the farm. Uh, there was a range of different bits. So your early childhood memories were being involved in that in some shape or form. And uh, I think spending a lot of time with my, my grandmother and I, particularly as, as a child, you know, you'd be around her. She was a fantastic cook. So there was always this sense of hosting and an open door policy in the house. There'd always be at that time um, what, what were pr predominantly workmen around and granny was always feeding them. So it was this abundance of food and, and a kind of fairly happy memories. It's like a good life. You've mentioned your granny a few times. Uh, do you think she would have been one of the few people who influenced or had a big impact on you while you're growing up? I think she she showed great resilience, and we talk about resilience a lot now. But you know, her her she outlived her husband by nearly three decades and continued to run businesses for a period of time, and 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 was a fiefdom in her own mind. You know, if 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 Ackle, a lot of it is commonage, and if anyone tried to cut turf on her bog or anything like that, by God, even in her later years, she'd be down and fairly able to go. Uh, so she she certainly had that that tenacity and that resilience that we talk to now. But I think many of people going back years ago in much more difficult times actually went through a hell of a lot more and managed to do it in a, in a gritty, understated way. A mm. couple of things I know about you from doing research. You've been to places or cities like Rome, Paris, countries like Netherlands, You've climbed Kilimanjaro. Um, <laughs> you claim to love being in airports. Yeah. What's um, what's one thing that you're into or curious about that not a lot of people know about you? Oh, I think it's just that whole excitement of going to a new location, getting a sense of the 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 people, the culture, the food, the scene, uh, and and I'm always. You know, once you travel to a new location, you're, you're inspired. In, there, there's something you'll see that you think, wow, I wish we had that or we should have that or I'm definitely coming back to do that. And, and it's it's that trod to me. And I love going off the beaten track. So you'll do your touristy stuff and that's fine. But actually, sometimes the more fun and the more engagement you'll have is by going off the beaten track and and being in the company of, of just really, really curious people. I hate when you you do a trip with someone and everything is planned to within an inch of its life. Uh, so certainly when I'm, I'm traveling, it's those that are kind of open to doing anything is, is what I like. Agreed. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an active rester myself, so I don't like to lie at the beach. I like to get out and do things. Um, so I know that you've got a ton of experience in tourism and hospitality. I believe you worked in a restaurant on Ackle Island at 16. But before we get to that, you studied finance in college. I know UCD did a lot of finance, financial services, financial planning and management, did a diploma uh, in SME credit management. Where did the interest in finance come from? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I think as a teenager, I began to rule out or negotiate what I didn't like and what I didn't want to do. And I spent one summer at the age of, oh God, 13 or 14 on a building site. And I knew that I knew that definitely wasn't for me. 
Um, I think once I remember falling over with a wheelbarrow of concrete and going headfirst into it with my mouth open, and that was definitely the end of that career. And I, I think you you look, there was always, I, I remember my parents were, as I said, in business, but but times were tricky and, and difficult. And the engagement with the bank and the bank manager was always a, a you know, a stressful topic. And I remember as a child accompanying them into different meetings with the bank manager, who at that time had a nice shiny office. Of course, this was a different era of branches where it literally was the mahogany setting around it. And I always remember being enamored and thinking, wow, this would be a cool job. I think that's where the seed was was definitely sown. And it was either going to be looking at finance or potentially law. And I had kind of a, 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 an unusual route into it because not neither of my parents had been to college or, or people in their family really hadn't. So that wasn't the trend. The trend was you 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 worked. So to appease my my mother, there was what was then called the RDS. It was the Foss Careers Exhibition, as it was known in 1999 in, in the RDS. And that was the year of my leaving cert. So I'd applied through the CAO for your typical roles that you'd imagine in, in law and finance. And to appease her, I we hit the train one Saturday morning or whatever day of the week it was. I don't know the weekend or during the week, but anyways, of course, the RDS was like a maze. And at that stage, there were so many companies recruiting and I just got loads of applications from different places. So I remember on the train down, starting filling out these manual forms and it was I ended up being called for next round from three organizations, uh, AIB, Ulster Bank and Deutsche Bank, and started going through the process because we were going through the motions. And little did I think that come July of that year, I had offers of permanent employment at the age of 17, coming on 18 in September from both AIB and uh, Deutsche Bank. And I often think if I took Deutsche, where would I have ended up now? But of course, with Pirinke guidance and whatever else, AIB was the trusted organization. So when I was heading to Dublin in September, I always remember the date, 12th September 99. My friends were on the train with me and they were all starting college the next morning and I was starting an AIB in Bank Centre in Balls Bridge for those that are familiar. It's now Facebook that own that building. And um, what, what happened that week in the first few days, and I always think relationship building is, is really important, but there were one or two guys from the West working there in senior enough roles, and they were looking to get people, staff, traditional staff, to sign up for different Institute of Bankers programming. And someone said, we're looking for people to sign up for what was a certain investment planning and advice. And I said, I don't care what I sign up for. And I literally, so I was in the door a few days and signed up for this program. And that ended up being the start of a five-year program of study, uh, part-time coalescing with work, where I got my, my first uh, qualification, which was the finance degree through UCD and the Institute of Bankers. So I went from, it, it was actually, it was a stroke of luck and maybe genius on, on my parents' side, but rather than them funding me through college, I actually was funded through college and got paid bonuses every time I passed an exam. I was a year later than my peers, but at that stage, I had also managed to build up five years' work experience with it. So it just... It, as I say, it turned out it was a bit of luck and a bit of foresight. I, I'm not sure where in between. Wow, that's uh, that's uh, interesting. You get paid to go to college rather than paying to go to college. You've mentioned the year in 1999, Balls Bridge and relationship building. You said something in an interview before and you said, started your working career, ALB, 1999, Balls Bridge. On reflection, relationship building and giving without question, have been important enablers to development of my career. So my question is, how important do you think networking is in your career starting out? I think it's it's critical. Um, I, I worry at the risk of sounding old, I worry about let's say looking at those in their teens now because the when I was a child and a teenager, you were through people it was you know you were mixing with adults you were engaging I, okay my background as i say there was a bit of a business thing so there was a flow of people naturally coming through the house you had a guest house or a shop or whatever but that gave you the ability to engage in awkward circumstances and you wouldn't you couldn't imagine the amount of adults now i meet younger adults than myself those coming through in the millennial gen y or you know that 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 cohort who struggle and engage walking into a room full of people when we could do that of course hopefully we'll get back there again even within my own teams and AIB, people would, you'd say, go to a business development event and will you go and meet X, Y, and Z? People don't have the, the, the first principles of how you even start to do that. And there's a fear. And what they'll do is come into a room and they might identify one person and the two of them will stay huddled in the corner for the evening. You have to be able to walk in through, into a room or any environment 
with that bit of confidence and, and you're putting yourself out there, of course, as well, there's a bit of a nervousness, but people respect that. They love someone who come up and engage. It's also a great way of trust building. If you join a new team and you don't begin to engage with them and it's not all about work and it's not all false, you have to be authentic and, and you know, genuinely, if someone says something about their son or their daughter or their nephew at the weekend, then roll back on the Monday or Tuesday. How did the weekend go? How did your son or daughter or nephew get on with whatever they're doing? Trust is something very tricky that takes time to be built up. But once you're in an environment and you're surrounded by peers or stakeholders or leaders who can have influence in your life and they trust you, it's amazing opportunities you won't be found wanting for them. So I, I think it's it's really important. And as I say, I, I worry, I, I look now at some of my cousin's kids on either side and they're in a very different environment and it's it's Snapchat and they'll send you a text before they'll engage with you in a meaningful way. And that's going to be really tricky for that whole cohort as we move into back to normal environment and they're looking for opportunities. Great advice. I've seen it more and more these days. I'm, I'm 28 this month and so I'm uh, not the of the Snapchat generation, but I have seen people who would rather text over phone call they might reject the phone call to text and they also wouldn't feel comfortable ringing up their dentist to book an appointment because they don't want to talk to people. So I, I can see it. It confuses me, but I can also understand why. Um, however, focusing on that generation, let's say if you were given the a magic wand to add one mandatory subject to the Leaving Cert curriculum, what one subject would you add? It's actually a practical one, and you might laugh at this, but I think that, and particularly the scope for it in the TY year, I think that the best experience of all the experiences in, in life formation I've had so far has been working in a restaurant. Once you work in a service environment, you get a great sense of people. You get, you, you get to meet so many different personas, some positive and some absolutely dreadful. You get to figure out how to react to bad behavior in a good way so that you're not adding to it, how to rise above situations and sometimes to make, you know, to accept that, oh God, I absolutely messed that up. Um, and I actually think that is, is, is such a powerful skill to, to have later in life. Uh, so I think some aspect of a practical, it's not about another theoretical program. You could say, well, everyone should do politics or do a program now in sustainability so they understand the environmental impact. I think more and more of that will come because program, programming is going to be intertwined with those type of agendas. But we need to try and help people who are introverted get more comfortable with being in uncomfortable positions. And we need to get those who are extroverted but just don't know how to use it to actually begin to build up their experience in terms of how they deal with situations. And it's interesting, as, as part of my role at, at the moment, even in lockdown, I'm traveling a little and I've been staying in hotels. And it's interesting over the last few weeks, you're seeing staff coming on, uh, coming on board, preparing for opening up, which is today. And I'm talking about 19, 20 and 21 year olds who look like they're rabbits in the headlights. It's their first time in a dining room and they are so struggling and so nervous. And they're going to struggle over the next week or two and have an awful meltdown in some cases. But if there was intervention, if many of those people had part time jobs working in service industry, because I always think as well, if you work in the service industry, you will always be respectful to those around you. Um, and I see it within some of my own families, you know, people click, cracking their fingers and, you know, this isn't good enough and that person isn't good enough. That's not a way to treat people. So I, I think if there was one thing I'd look at programming, it's some manual element of work experience and ty has tried to do that but not in the not in the impactful way that it should and obviously COVID has impacted that in the last year or two but i think that should be nearly mandatory you come off as a genuinely nice guy kenny and i i just wanted to give you that compliment because it was in my head um you you said the best advice you ever got was you can't fight every battle and no. it was advice from an aib banker in westport how do you interpret that I think you, let's say if, if, if you're, let's say in my role at the moment, I mean, it's working in a city, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a core group of 20, 25 people in organizations, different leaders you're working with. Uh, there will be some things you don't agree with, but you think, okay, well, do you know what? We can go with the flow on that. There are other items that you don't agree with and you say, no, this is a deal breaker. I'm going to fight on that. And people respect that accommodation and equally many will come from the same position. But the challenge you have is sometimes you have people who are fighting every battle and they have a problem with everything. 
And as one friend of mine um, who, who has great experience over, over time, he's a priest, he talks about some people being like a cloud on a sunny day, that they'll suck the energy out of a room and they'll always have an issue. And I think those who are fighting every battle, and you can see them sometimes in interviews, and this is a disaster, and that's terrible, and this is awful. People back away from that type of persona. They don't want to be around them because there's always a negative angle. There's always something more they're looking for. So I think in, in particularly as, as people move into leadership and you're looking to coalesce with others, there has to be compromise. You pick the battle that you know is really important to you. You may or may not win it. But if you're the person that's always got an extra grind and always got an agenda and always got a chip on their shoulder, not many will want to be in your company. Mm. Focusing on the travel hospitality industry, I actually did it. My, my degree is in tourism management from mm. DIT. Um, what is the is there a belief out there in that industry that you disagree with like a commonly held belief within tourism hospitality mm. um i'm not sure I'm, i i think in this at the moment there's a perception that jobs in that industry aren't good jobs i don't know if this is correctly answering your question but certainly mm. what covid has led to is a perception from some in wider industry that, you know, they wouldn't encourage their kids to go into tourism and hospitality as careers, because typically they're being seen as lower paid service type roles. Um, and I, I would disagree. I, I, I'm 50 50 on that to a point, but I actually think jobs and going back to my earlier point, jobs in that industry give you great opportunity. They give you great opportunity to travel around the world. Your skills are transferable once you bring a language element to it, depending on where you're going. So there's many people that I've certainly come across in my network in my time who, for example, may have trained as chefs. They've worked in restaurants all around the world and they've got great opportunities to learn how to cook in different cultures. And that has enabled them as they've come back now and opened up their own properties. So I think if, if I was to follow that thread and I'm, I'm not sure am I on the ball of your question or not, I, I think that, you know, you can't you can't just take a monetary lens on an industry. Certainly, if we look at roles in tourism, hospitality versus in tech or software or that, without a doubt, there's a disparity in pay. But some who work in tourism, hospitality would never want to work in those other industries either. And I think we always have to look at those transferable skills. Many employers would love to take leaders on who've come through tourism, hospitality, because they know the experience that they bring to the table is, is phenomenal and far more than someone who was beavering away in the back of an office for the last four years and hasn't talked to two customers. It's an industry I'm a fan of. Um, I'm on my second business. Hopefully this one is successful as well. Um, but in the future, I would love to one day uh, own a bar and get back involved in that industry. I just love talking and chatting to people. It's great. Yeah. Um, you now own Ackle Lodge since 2007. Two-part question. One, how did that come about? <laughs> and what's your favorite aspect of owning that business or the lodge? I, I think, uh, well, certainly the lodge is the... The, the lodge I'd never be able to do without the support of family because obviously I'm I'm um, I've I've a job and a half and a bit as 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 it is. I think the the beginning I'll start with the the second question first. It's that sense again of of hosting and hospitality. And for me, you know, I go home at the weekends sometimes, and I love nothing more on a Saturday or Sunday morning if if time permits than just to get into mode and start cooking breakfast. And, and be in, you know, in the heart of the buzz of everything that's happening in the house. And it's that whole sense that not just me, but my wider family, and maybe we didn't appreciate this as much until COVID came. We've always been used to people in and out of the house. And they've nearly gone mad over the last 12 months because we've been closed with the exception of that three months. And that was a kind of a nervous three months because people didn't know what was happening in COVID and vaccines weren't really on the table and whatever else. Now it's different and there's such excitement i was speaking this morning the first guests are checking back in tonight and within the family you know there's the buzz of ramping up again there's been repainting work going on over the last few weeks doing diy around the house and it's that just and i know to some people i remember one friend coming down from dublin who, who lived in an apartment on her own and she nearly lost the plot because there's a couple of doors in and out of the house and there were just people going everywhere and she couldn't cope with this concept of people randomly coming through the house. To me, that brings energy and you 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 engage uh, with so many different people from typically so many different countries. And uh, that's powerful. You've achieved a lot, you know, you, you, you've spent uh, over a decade in, in, in the banking. We've alluded to how long you've spent in tourism and hospitality. 
today, what continues to drive you? Oh, today, I think it's about knowing that, you know, okay, you'll make mistakes sometimes and you'll get things wrong. That's what I'm about. And there'll be plenty, plenty of people to remind you that you've made a bold of it uh, as well. I just think that we've such opportunity to drive change um, under no matter what area you look at. Uh, people who are willing to give time and energy and invest in making things better. And that sounds very cliche, but there may be a particular piece. For example, one conversation that I had earlier today was looking at another city in Ireland that has launched a very successful app in, in the sustainability space and in cycling in particular. And we're looking and we're saying, OK, we don't have that in the West. The technology is there. The know how is there. We've got lots of willing people who are volunteering in this space. So how can we make that happen? And the first drafting of an application has taken place today in terms of trying to begin that. Now, it might take 12 months, it might take 18 months, it might take six months, or it may never happen. But knowing that you have the potential to drive change and keep improving things is something that I just really, really enjoy. And, you know, it's, it's even you're thinking, OK, how can we get more engagement for the West, which is something that my, I'm absolutely passionate about. And if we look at political representation, while there are some really, really good members of the Oireachtas from the West, they're not in senior enough positions, with the exception of, of Hildegard Nocton. So we've hosted a whole political leader series and it's ongoing. So we had Mary Lou MacDonald last week with Leo Radker Monday week. And we're going to get all the leaders of the different parties to bang the drum for the West because we know that we're on, we, we don't have senior enough politicians in positions that can affect change. So I know by us having this campaign along with my board, we'll bring the West to bear and present it to those people. So it's just knowing that bit by bit, you can drive change positively. And as I say, you'll make an odd mistake, but if you don't try, that's worse than, than plowing ahead the way we are at the minute. You mentioned Mary Lou, Leo, and the parties aside, it, it is, is part of that in the hope that as well to kind of uh, have something for uh, people to, to aspire and look towards and then potentially get more people involved in politics to hopefully increase what you want to achieve, yeah? Yeah, um, absolutely. And more and more, there are some fantastic people who have an interest and capability to do politics, but just are fearful of it. And I think the more and more you engage with politicians at all levels, the more you create understanding of the process. And I, I think some are very good at talking to this. I remember Maria Walsh doing a, having a conversation last year, the MEP, and talking about her transition from what she was doing to coming into politics. And talking about the challenge of it and the nervousness, but also the fact that, you know, she very clearly throws herself out there that if I can do it, anyone can do it. And we need more and more role models in those type of positions talking in that way so that you move away from the potential language of not, not that there's anything wrong with it. And there are some fantastic reps in family dynasties, but there's a perception that certain politics are collegial and it's about family di dynasties and you won't be elected unless you're part of that. And we need to move away from that narrative and showcase that everyone has the opportunity in a level playing field. Investing in yourself. Um, I know that you've been to UCD to do those courses, UL to do a corporate MBA, NUIG to do a diploma in Irish language. I'm sure there's other ways you're part of the chamber. You're the CEO of the chamber. Uh, and any books, podcasts, documentaries, people of influence that you go to to continue to invest in yourself? Um, it's an interesting one. So definitely Tim Ferriss. Uh, is one mm. that I very much um, love. And I think I've, been, I've read all his books, some with more success than others. The four hour body, I'm afraid I'm still trying to muster up delivery on. But the four well, hour I haven't even opened it, don't worry. <laughs> the four hour work week was definitely a concept that, that I kind of thought, okay, you have to think in a different way. And one of the motivations, actually, in my later career in AIB, I took a career break for two years to do other things. And that was really formative and I think really impactful in me being able to transfer into this role in chamber because the experience I gained in that time was powerful. And I would say the majority of the motivation for that was Tim Ferriss's book in the four hour work week, where he talked about people spending their lives in a career uh, 40 years and then they retire to try and do the stuff that they have been trying to do all their life. But then they realize that either through limitations, portability, et cetera, they're not able to do the stuff they wanted to do. And he talked about these many retirements. And that was absolutely the inspiration for me taking that two year period out at the time um, where you can do wonderful things in a mini retirement and then return to your career if you want or do other stuff. 
So Ben, absolutely, Tim, and I follow his blogs and, and even The Tools of Titans is a fantastic book because that's him asking the same set of questions of different leaders in society, social society, business, politics, etc. So you're getting so many different perspectives. So I think that's that's one um, that I absolutely follow. To be fair, at a national level, I follow um, a lot of Pat Dively's blogs. I think he gets to interview some great mm -hmm. people. Um, and also, I've moved more into the audiobook world, so I just love listening to to content. And some can be your aspirational stuff. I remember being on a flight to Buenos Aires when, when I could, going back January last year, and uh, it was the 5 a.m. club, I think it was. I was still in a three-hour queue trying to get in through uh, customs in, in uh, Buenos Aires, listening to the end of the book. And rather than being tired and withdrawn, I was just thinking, wow, OK, this is, this is something that you could do. Um, so Audible definitely has, because I, I travel a lot and I drive a lot, so I, I now Audible talking and reading to me. Uh, which is useful, but definitely Tim Ferriss has been the most one that I would call inspirational. You just said you travel a lot, restrictions lifted, where would the first place you're going to go to be? Well, all I've been, I, I've been ambitiously booking trips and there we've ploughed a bus through a few of them in terms of cancellations. It's supposed to be in London in two weeks time, but that's not going to happen now either for uh, a West End show with, with a friend for, for a birthday. Um, there is mention of Greece potentially for the end of July, but that's dependent on the group of us looking at traveling being vaccinated. Um, I'm definitely, I, I'm involved in a project in Cleveland, Ohio each year, and typically we're in Cleveland at the third week in September. Unfortunately, that's cancelled. But what's looking likely is a weekend in Berlin at the beginning of October. And I think a trip to Brussels with work in later October. But uh, for now, I'll, I keep booking stuff ambitiously. And we're now going through the process of trying to get refunds and deferrals because still mm -hmm. haven't been able to go anywhere. I've had the same struggle myself. Two <laughs> final questions. Um, yeah. Your house is burning down, hypothetically. Ooh. Loved ones are all safe. Yeah. But you can only save one item. What one item is that going to be? Oh, God. Um... What item? I would have to say probably, you, you know, you're talking photo album type thing I love. There's this one large photo album we have in the house. I keep threatening to digitize it. It will take time and energy. It's not been done, so that's still there. It's probably loads, but but yeah, no, probably that. Great answer. You're the second person out of uh, probably 60, 62 podcasts that have said photo album. Majority have said their laptop, so I'm glad that you gave something <laughs> that wasn't digital. Uh, I'd like you to imagine it's the end of the decade. So it's the year 2030 and you're, we're now talking in 2030 and you're looking back on the previous decade. You can answer this personally or professionally, but what would you like to be looking back on? Um, ooh. Well, like you could take a personal or professional swing and there's loads of different ambitions and projects we have, but that's probably more clinical. I think on the personal side, the biggest kick I get out of my career to date is seeing people that you've trained or worked with or that have worked under you do well and progress themselves. And I think it's just it's it's being able to look back and see a bigger and bigger collection of people that you've positively impacted somehow, uh, like at a very practical level. And actually, I was only talking to this earlier. Um, someone was talking about LinkedIn and how they're not good on LinkedIn and they need to get better. And I said, well, you should go to such and such, because I always remember sitting down with this individual about five years ago and showing them how to create their LinkedIn profile, upload their picture and help them post their first post. And I still get a trickle of satisfaction every time I go in and I see that person is flat out now posting on LinkedIn and you're thinking, ah, I know I had a hand on that. But I think it's mm. that legacy, how you've helped others be better. Great answer. Kenny, we'll leave it there. I've thoroughly enjoyed spending the last 30 minutes getting to know you a little more. Um, I hope that you get to end up in Berlin and Brussels in October time and uh, that your businesses continue to thrive. But from my end, thank you for being my guest today. Not at all. Thank you, Reem, for having me.